The GameCube is a bit of a black sheep among Nintendo's home console lineup as far as legacy goes. It's sandwiched between the Nintendo 64, which was a powerhouse of nostalgia, and the Nintendo Wii, which was a sales juggernaut. Despite that status, this piece of hardware has its dedicated fans due to its solid lineup of games. From cult classics to games that launched entire franchises, the GameCube has plenty of quality titles. Of course, all of these games leave us with plenty of villains, but which ones are truly the worst of the worst? I'm Kyle with 1UP Binge, and this is GameCube Villains, Evil to Most Evil. We'll be using the same rules as our Nintendo 64 villain list. We're only looking at villains from the most popular and iconic games of the system. That is, only one villain per game. For villains who appear in multiple games, we'll be focusing on their appearances on the GameCube. And their games don't have to be GameCube exclusives. Also, we may get a bit creative with who we pick, in the interest of picking villains that better represent their games. With those clarifications out of the way, let's get into it. Like usual, we'll be starting with the least evil, and working our way down to the most evil. Starting with a character whose status as a villain is questionable at best, Mr. Rossetti from Animal Crossing. While Animal Crossing is mostly a life simulation game, it gives you a very clear opponent, the internal clock. In fact, everything you do is dictated by the clock, from when stores are open to what holidays are active. If you try to cheat this design feature, the game punishes you for it. The most iconic punishment is the irate mole, Sonny Rossetti. If you ever quit without saving, he'll appear next time you start up the game and scold you for it. He appears outside your house to lecture you on the importance of saving. If you reset too many times, he'll force you to repeat a sentence to him before you can continue playing. Or he'll try to scare you by pretending to delete all your progress. We place him here at the very beginning of our list because he's not really evil. He's just doing his job and he's ultimately harmless at the end of the day. Moving on to Olimar's partner in Pikmin 2, Louis. He may seem innocent at first, but Louis is essentially the cause of all the game's major conflicts. At the beginning of the game, we learn that Hakotate Freight has gone into massive debt because a ravenous space bunny ate an entire shipment of carrots. This forced the company into debt to recoup their losses. But as it turns out, there was no space bunny, and Louis is the one who ate the carrots. In order to avoid being found out, he stayed behind on PNF 404 when Olimar returned to Hakote. He hid at the bottom of the Dream Den. It's heavily implied that he was controlling the Titan Dweevil when Olimar and the President came to save him. Louis ranks near the bottom because it's unlikely he had any malicious intent. The incident with the carrots was just because of his appetite, and everything else was likely to avoid being found out. Still, his actions cost Olimar his old ship, forced him away from his family, who he was worried he'd never see again, and aside from that, he nearly bankrupted a company and put Olimar and the President in danger when they were trying to rescue him. Even if he didn't mean any harm, he sure caused a lot of it. Next up is Captain Blue from Beautiful Joe. He was once a famous director who wanted to give his audience a great hero to look up to. His films were nominated for many awards, but people quickly forgot about them, until one day he was sucked into one of his movies and became the hero known as Captain Blue. He fought many battles against the forces of evil, but slowly forgot who he was and eventually became a villain himself. By the time we see him in the game, he's the leader of the sinister Jadao organization. He's plotting to escape movie land and take over the real world as revenge. To carry out this plan, he kidnaps his daughter, Sylvia, forcing Joe to go after him and become a hero himself. While he's obviously done a lot of evil, it can be argued this happened because of him spending too much time trapped in movie land. He's also psychologically broken by being forgotten. That obviously doesn't justify world domination, but he started off with the best intentions and came to his senses after being beaten by Joe. Plus, the fact that he gave Joe the V-Watch in the first place shows at least part of his heroic self was still in there. Up next are the spiders from Chibi Robo. They were designed by Mr. Sanderson, who worked for Maroware Robotics, a competitor to the company that made Chibi Robos. Sanderson designed them to be friends to the Chibi Robos. However, his his company reprogrammed the spiders to attack them. Their leader, the Queen Spider, even imprisons its host family near the end of the game. 
They're pretty destructive, but it's tough to hold them accountable for their actions, as they're just robots obeying their programming. Up next is the terror of Isle Delfino, Bowser Jr. Yes, Bowser may technically be the main villain of Super Mario Sunshine, but he only really shows up at the end of the game, while his son is present throughout the entire game. Before the game starts, he uses EGAD's magic paintbrush to spread sludge all over Isle Delfino, while disguised as Mario. Unfortunately, this polluted the land and created many hazards, including the electric and burning sludge. It also made the Shine Sprites flee the Shine Gate, causing Delfino Plaza to fall into darkness. This also resulted in Mario being blamed for the crime and forced to clean up the mess. Bowser Jr. also kidnaps Princess Peach because it wouldn't be a Mario game without that happening. Also, since all the bosses and some of the enemies turn to sludge when defeated, we can assume that he created them as well. Now, ecological terrorism, kidnapping, and endangering people with monsters build up quite the rap sheet, especially for someone so young. But there are a few factors that prevent him from being ranked any lower. For starters, he's just a kid, likely being influenced by his father and operating off of false information. After all, he seemingly only kidnapped Peach because he thought she was his mother. Second, unlike most real-world ecological disasters, Bowser Jr.'s toxic paint is easily cleaned up. Finally, while he causes the most trouble out of anyone, stems from the Piantas being selfish idiots. Despite Isle Delfino being in a state of emergency, they hoard plenty of shines for themselves, they give them away as prizes and rewards. A single shopkeeper hoards almost a quarter of them when they all need to be returned to the Shine Gate. Sure, Bowser Jr. caused a lot of the problems, but Isle Delfino was still pretty dysfunctional without him. From one Mario villain who isn't Bowser to another, we have King Boo. While King Boo has committed a lot of evil throughout the Luigi's Mansion trilogy, his actions in the original are relatively tame. His involvement starts when Egad captures Bulosis and turns him into a painting. King Boo was enraged by this and attacked Egad's lab, and freed Bulosis and the other portrait ghosts. He then used his powers to create a mansion for them to hide out in. Now, there's nothing wrong with this so far. It's arguably admirable since the ethics of Egad trapping ghosts and paintings are questionable at best. The problem is what he does next. He traps Mario in a painting and lures Luigi to the mansion, hoping to do the same to him. There is no justification for this, though he says it's for revenge. Even then, he's just mad at Mario for interfering with his plans in the past which were probably evil. Not only that, but he also puts the ghosts he freed at risk. With the exceptions of Bulosis and possibly Van Gore, the ghosts were content to simply live in the mansion. However, luring Mario and Luigi leads to them getting vacuumed up and stuck in paintings again. So really, anything good he did was undone by his petty quest for revenge. Dark Samus serves as the main villain of Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, and to an extent, the trilogy as a whole. Dark Samus is a creature mostly made up of Phazon, an incredibly poisonous and corrosive substance that either kills or mutates most organisms within seconds. It's really tough to judge its actions in Echoes as it seems to operate off of instinct, only really caring about absorbing more Phazon. However, it does fight Samus at plenty of opportunities, so there's clearly some amount of ill intent in there. Still, since it's really hard to gauge that intent, we can't rank it any lower. Moving on to the main villain of Super Monkey Ball 2, Dr. Badboon. He came from a future where Mimi is already married to AA, so he travels back in time to be the one married to her instead. He tries a number of schemes to coerce her into marrying him, such as placing a bomb in Jungle Island's volcano and using a shrink ray on the gang. It also involves creating robots to frame AA for stealing the world's banana supply and creating a laser that would make all the world's bananas taste like curry. All of this destruction is aimed at forcing someone who's not interested in marrying him, which is seriously creepy. But it's hard to rank him any lower due to just how ridiculous some of these plans are. Next is a classic Nintendo villain, Ganondorf. For the sake of this list, we're going to focus on his appearance in Wind Waker, as we have someone else in mind for Twilight Princess. Before the events of Wind Waker, Ganondorf had taken over Hyrule. In order to stop him, the gods flooded the kingdom, creating the Great Sea. This version of Ganondorf is power hungry, just like all the rest, but is also portrayed in a more sympathetic light than his previous incarnations. He's still after the Triforce, 
and his main crime was sending the Helmaric king after Zelda, which resulted in a lot of innocent people being captured. But really, he was only trying to kidnap one person. In addition, we get greater insight into Ganon's motives. His people, the Gerudo, were forced into the deserts of Hyrule, where they suffered harsh living conditions while the royal family ignored their plight. This obviously doesn't justify his quest for the Triforce, but it's at least a good reason for wanting to take over Hyrule, as opposed to other games where he just wants power for the sake of power. Next up is a tie between two incredibly similar villains, Avis from Pokemon Colosseum and Grievel from Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. Both are leaders of the crime syndicate Cypher, with Avis leading the Aura branch and Grievel being in charge of the entire organization. The group has either overrun or completely taken over most cities in Aura. They steal people's Pokemon and turn them into Shadow Pokemon, which makes them more powerful, but they also remove their emotions, turning them into soulless fighting machines. Not only is this mass animal cruelty, or Pokemon cruelty, but it's also theft, and there are eventual plans for world domination too. Now, if we had to pick, we'd say that Grievel is a bit worse, as he didn't just stop at corrupting Pokemon, but also tried to make it impossible to purify them again. Despite this difference, these two are still too similar to put in separate spots. Moving on to Liquid Snake. Just like Solid Snake, he's a clone of the famous soldier Big Boss. The only difference is that Liquid is made up of Big Boss's recessive traits, which he feels makes him inferior. As a result, he developed a burning hatred for Big Boss and plotted his revenge. Along with a couple of other superpowered soldiers, he staged an insurrection on Shadow Moses Island and took control of their nuclear weapons and Metal Gear Rex. His demands were simple, deliver the body of Big Boss, or he would launch nukes at the White House. In the interest of time, we won't get into all the story details, but in summary, Liquid caused a national crisis and killed a bunch of people. He also threatened to topple the United States government, all because of his daddy issues and inferiority complex. Now onto our other Zelda villain, Zant. Yes, Ganondorf is technically the main villain of Twilight Princess. Still, Zant had just as much of a presence in the game. He was also unique to this installment, so we decided to go with him. Zant was originally next in line to rule the Twilight Realm, but many were concerned with his ambitions, so the power was given to Midna instead. This led Zant to lose trust in the royal family, especially since he resented that the Twilight were stuck in the Twilight Realm. He searched for guidance and was influenced by Ganondorf, believing him to be a god. As a result, he overthrew Midna, stole her powers, and turned her into an imp. He then turned the other Twilight into shadow beasts and attempted to spread the Twilight Realm across Hyrule. Also, when Midna wouldn't give him her powers, he exposed her to the light of Lanairu, which almost killed her. Now, Zant's motives are understandable. He was also taken advantage of in a moment of weakness which is why he isn't ranked any lower. However, still, trying to take over Hyrule and corrupting the people he claims to be fighting for is still pretty damn evil. Moving on to the main antagonist of the original Metroid Prime and one of the main villains of Metroid as a whole, Ridley. Or Meta Ridley in this case. He's well known as the ruthless space pirate captain who brutally massacred Samus's parents. On top of that, he spends most of Metroid Prime experimenting on various creatures by exposing them to Phazon, a substance literally referred to as the Great Poison. On top of that, he attacks Samus numerous times. There isn't really much more to say. Ridley is a terrible guy, and this was a pretty standard outing for him. We definitely can't forget about Grotus from Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Grotus is a cold, calculating, and cruel man with one goal in mind, world domination. He aims to accomplish this by obtaining the Crystal Stars to unleash the ancient demon underneath Rogueport. He has a sadistic personality, taking pleasure in torturing his enemies and resetting his sentient computer the moment it grew a conscience. We don't actually know how Grotus intended to rule the world. Given his actions throughout the game, it's safe to say it would have been a disaster. Next is the Vizier from Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. He served as the advisor to the Maharaja. Due to his old age, he desired the secret to immortality. 
To achieve this, he needed the hourglass and dagger of time from the treasure vault. So he made an alliance with the king of Persia to overthrow the Maharaja and steal his treasure. However, when the king decided to keep the dagger and hourglass for himself and his son, the vizier tricked the prince into releasing the sands of time from the hourglass. Give me the dagger. He then used the sands to turn all living things in the country into sand creatures. We understand death is scary, so immortality is a tantalizing concept, but turning an entire kingdom into sand creatures is far too high of a price. While it's technically different, it's functionally the same as murdering the population of a large country. It's possible he intended to reverse these effects when he got the Dagger of Time, but that's too much of an open question for us to give him any meaningful credit for it. Osmond Sadler from Resident Evil 4 takes manipulation to a whole new level. He discovered and modified a parasite that would allow him to control the minds of anyone he implanted it into. He would get people to join his cult and then implant the parasite as part of a cleansing ritual. I'll have total control over your minds. Of course, he didn't stop with the small town he was controlling. He also had the president's daughter kidnapped in an attempt to gain control of him. There really isn't much more to say. Having someone implant a parasite into you that robs you of your free will and turns you into a mindless, obedient zombie is a scary thought. The idea of doing it on a national scale is even scarier. Next up is Ajnard, the main villain of Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. His main goal is to obtain Loran's medallion and unleash the Dark God inside of it. He plans to do this by invading Crimea in an attempt to start a continent-wide war. That alone is bad enough, but he also took power by killing everyone in front of him in line for the throne and implemented a system in his country where the strong dominate the weak. There's also the matter of the Dark God, who turns out not to be so bad in Radiant Dawn. But knowing Ajnard, he likely didn't know this and planned to use the Dark God for his own nefarious purposes. Even if his intentions with unleashing a being called the Dark God were pure, that still doesn't excuse the insane amount of bloodshed it took him to get there. The only thing that keeps him out of the top three is the fact that a few other villains cause destruction on an even grander scale. Our bronze medal of evil goes to the Dom Z from Beyond Good and Evil. They declare war on humanity, and everyone assumes it's over natural resources. However, their actual motive is to drain humans of all their energy to increase their own lifespans. To accomplish this, they mutated the Alpha Sections, the group supposedly fighting them, which made them obey their every command. The energy stealing process is brutal. It involves kidnapping people, torturing them into submission, and shipping them off to the moon to be absorbed by the High Priest. In other words, this is a brutal genocide committed against all of humanity. The only reason they miss the top two is because their ambitions are seemingly limited to one species. Our silver medal of evil goes to Deathborn from F-Zero GX. He's the Grand Prix champion of the underworld and wants the champion's belt from the overworld as well. So he sends Black Shadow and tells him to win it by any means necessary. As a result, we can hold Deathborn accountable for all of Black Shadow's actions. Throughout the game, Black Shadow attacks Lightning and straps Captain Falcon into his car along with a bomb that will detonate if he drops below a certain speed. Of course, Falcon survives and defeats Black Shadow, causing Deathborn to kill Shadow and reveal his true plan. It turns out that combining both champions' belts gives the person wielding them enough power to rule the universe. Granting this kind of power to someone as brutal as Deathborn would likely lead to an untold amount of suffering, especially since he says he could destroy the entire galaxy. The only thing that stops him from getting the gold is that we don't know how he would rule the universe. He never actually says he's going to destroy the galaxy, just that he could. Still, even if he didn't destroy the galaxy, things would be a disaster with someone like Deathborn in control. Finally, the Gold Medal of Evil goes to the Aperoid Queen from Star Fox Assault. The Aperoids are a race of aliens that assimilate other organisms. The Queen produces all of the other forces and controls everything, so for all intents and purposes, everything the Aperoids have done can be blamed on her. She's also highly intelligent, adapting to changing circumstances and even talking to the Star Fox team using the people she assimilated. Hence why we can't say that she's doing this out of some sort of primal instinct. 
Instead, it's out of a sense of superiority. She believes her race is superior to all other life forms and deserves to control the entire universe. And that's exactly what she tries to do. Universal conquest is about as far as you can go when it comes to evil plans, especially when there's not even a hint of ambiguity or of any altruistic motive. As a result, we can't think of anyone else more deserving of the gold medal of evil. But let us know in the comments section who you think is the most evil GameCube villain. Do you agree with our ranking? And are there any other characters we should have included? Don't forget to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite games. Thanks for watching.